about him, so I would like to turn the stage over to Lee Feldman and his presentation. Not as tall as Craig, I have to move these down. So good morning, and, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, chat with you uh, at, your, uh, at your 64th annual conference. After I received uh, the invitation from your legendary executive director, Beth Armstrong, I kept asking myself, why me? Uh, and I think the answer is simple. She couldn't get anybody else to commit to speaking after Craig Fugate. <laughs> so on a, uh, on a personal note, I've been working in local government for over 31 years. And there are very few individuals that I can honestly say truly embody the essence and high standards of public service. And Administrator Craig Fugate is certainly one of them. During the last eight years that I've been a member of the FEMA National Advisory Council, I've truly seen FEMA revitalized and repurposed under his common sense, survivor-centric, whole community philosophy that has been impressed upon the areas of preparedness and protection, response and recovery, and mitigation. And on behalf of uh, all those who serve in local government where disasters happen, I want to thank Craig uh, for his service, uh, not only to the nation, but to the states and local governments. So as a, a keynote speaker, I'm told that my job is to entertain you and at the same time impart some words of wisdom. So let me pause uh, right now and, and get to the wisdom piece, and, uh, and I'm going to share some of the thoughts of Winston Churchill for you. So here's some of his wisdom. So knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it into a fruit salad. One that I, uh, I believe is at the core of, uh, of every emergency manager's uh, philosophy, you don't need a parachute to skydive, you only need a parachute to skydive twice. <laughs> One that uh, I hear every day in my office is, I didn't say it was your fault, I said I was blaming you. And one that I hope will not be uh, your impression of me when I conclude, since light travels faster than sound, some people appear bright until you hear them speak. <laughs> so while some of you this morning are wondering uh, why a city manager is speaking to a group of emergency management professionals, I'm sure that there are some in this room this morning that just want to know what is a city manager. So for those of you who are Parks and Recreation fans, you may be familiar with Chris Traeger, the bionic man, the city manager of Pawnee, Indiana. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, fans of True Detective, you'll certainly know Ben Casper, uh, their city manager, who was a little bit on the crooked side. So he ended up like this in the first episode. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, as you tell, I will be more partial to the Rob Lowe version. So the short answer is that a city manager, who's also known, depending on the jurisdiction, as a city administrator, a county manager, a town manager, a borough manager, a village manager, and a host of other names, some of which I will not repeat this morning, uh, but I will use the term city manager in the generic form as I go through these remarks. So the city manager serves at the pleasure of a governing body, usually a mayor and city council, or a city commission, or a county commission, and serves as the chief executive officer of that governmental entity. So uh, as, uh, as Craig pointed out to you this morning, all disasters are really local. They happen in cities, in counties, in townships around this country, literally every day of the year. So that you, as emergency managers, need to really understand the relationship between the city manager 
and emergency management. And it's very important that you do that because in, this, in the United States today, there are 3,031 counties, 19,522 municipalities, and 16,364 townships. And they all have somebody running them. Sometimes it will be a city manager, sometimes it will be a strong mayor, but there will be somebody at the head serving as that executive. So let me put this into maybe a more concrete perspective for those of you in emergency management. You've all heard of the Cascadia Subduction Zone, right? right? How many of you have heard of the Cascadia Subduction Zone? It should be every hand in this room. So that's just this like mere 9.0 earthquake that's supposed to happen every 280 years, but hasn't happened for the last 300 years. And as Ken Murphy, the regional FEMA administrator, has said, that will make everything I, west of I-5 toast. Okay, that's a, that's a lot. So that means uh, like $80 billion worth of damage, 30,000 injuries, 10,000 people dead, and all within the first 20 minutes of the event. So if you look at the Washington coast and you look at the area west of I-5, there are 16 cities that range from populations of 865 to 198,000 that all operate under the council manager form of government. That's 575,000 potential victims that will be related to somebody in the council manager form of government. That's why you as emergency managers need to know about what we do every day and how we relate. And then there's Hurricane Matthew and its aftermath in Lumberton, North Carolina. Steve Clark, city manager. Hilton Head, South Carolina. Steve Riley, town manager. And right here in Savannah, Georgia, where you met this morning Rob Hernandez, the city manager. And as it was mentioned, Rob's first day on the job was the day Matthew came ashore. And while most new city managers are worried about where the vending machines are located, Rob had to worry about where the EOC was located and what his position and role would be. So the bottom line is that if you're in emergency management today, either in the area of preparedness and protection, response or recovery, hazard mitigation, you will come across and have to deal with a city manager or two sometime in the future, remembering every disaster is local. So it's important to understand how the city manager relates to the emergency management universe. And I also want to point out that due to the size of a lot of localities, most cities are under 20,000 in population, and the resources that are affected, you're going to find that the city manager is in essence the de facto emergency manager for that community. And they've had little or no training in that role. So it might not be too bad if all you had to deal with was an occasional hurricane, tornado, flood, quake, or other natural uh, catastrophe. But these days, you've got to be thinking, we as city managers do, about items such as the contamination of your water supply by a chemical spill as happened in the Elk River Chemical in Charleston, West Virginia, or incidents of mass violence like the shooting in Aurora, Colorado uh, several years ago, train der derailments such as the one that happened in Hoboken a couple weeks ago, and cyber attacks by little groups like Anonymous, which happened in my own community in Fort Lauderdale three years ago. So all these things are happening, and they are really, truly making up what your theme of the conference is, that today's emergency management is working in a complex world. So in the spirit of Winston Churchill, I'm going to share with you now what I believe to be are the four traits, or the four thoughts, or the four items, rules, whatever you want to call them, that a city manager is going to be thinking about during that emergency. So first, we don't know what we don't know. Now, I know how to spell ICS, okay? And, uh, and since I took IS 100 
700 and 800. I'm an expert in NIMS, right? <laughs> but other than that, okay, good luck in telling me about emergency management. We rely upon you, each and every one in this, in this room today, and the others that couldn't be here, to provide us the guidance and to teach us the principles of preparedness, response, and recovery, hopefully before the event, but more often than not, during and after, the, and after the event. If you take anything away from here this morning, please take this thought home with you. It is time to go home and have an honest conversation with your city manager, whoever that may be, about the need to understand the principles of emergency management along with the roles and responsibilities of the leadership of the organization prior to ever walking in to that EOC. Yeah, I, I like the big satellite pictures uh, out there. It makes me think you know what you're doing, right? But you need to have that conversation. You don't want to find out that you or the city manager have a conflict as to who's in charge of the event during the event. You want to make sure that you have the concepts of mitigation and, and talking about hazard mitigation as you're moving forward. And you also want to make sure, and this is probably the most important thing, that you end up with a seat at the table during budget and resource allocation, during the discussion about what grants to apply for, and more importantly, about the future land use of your cities, counties, and townships. Make sure that you exercise your plan, both announced and unannounced, with the senior leadership right up to the top and make sure that they are there and, in Craig's words, not briefed on what's going to happen. But make sure that they're not only present but that they are engaged. I need to walk into that EOC with an understanding that there's still a lot that I don't know your job is to make sure I do that. Second, and this is something I borrowed from Craig, tell me what I need to know, not what you think I want to hear. The relationship between the emergency manager and the city manager must be one of trust, built upon a foundation of honesty. In a crisis, there will be no time to stroke egos or, to, or the surplus stamina to second-guess motives. If I'm making a wrong decision, tell me. I need to hear that. The city manager must effectively communicate the needs of the community, including the political needs, and I'll mention those again in a minute. And the emergency manager must effectively communicate the situa situational realities. Feel free to use the words with all due respect, and when you do, I will certainly know the wisdom that's going to follow. Third, nothing is impossible for the person who doesn't have to do it. I often call this the city manager's rule. And it's, uh, it's based upon, more often than not, the political realities that are being thrust upon the event. One of the primary roles of the city manager during the crisis is to insulate the team and you from the politics that may just be as strong as the other forces bearing pressure on the community. Just to digress for a minute, does everybody know where the word politics comes from? The Greek word poly, meaning many, ticks, little insects that bite. <laughs> so so keep, keep in mind that the politicians will become the face of your disaster. Not you, not me, it will be the politicians. And their portrayal of the events will have a direct effect on the public's perception of what's going on. The job of the city manager is to be the instrument of feedback between the community, the politicians, and you. If the politicians stand up at the press conference and say, Nothing's wrong, no need to evacuate, stay put, whatever the answer is, that's the direction that's going to be followed. If it's the wrong direction, it's because we haven't done our jobs together 
to communicate the right messaging. Also, I have observed, and I've probably been guilty of this myself, of displaying a frustration on the word no. No, we can't do that, or no, we can't get that, and hence, there's little appreciation in the city manager world for concepts such as EMAC, or the need to get mission numbers to receive resources and so forth. It all sounded pretty bureaucratic when you can just pick up the phone. And I should know about bureaucracy and being bureaucratic since I am one. And when that discussion is had, it is your time to remind the city manager again of what he doesn't know and what he really needs to hear and that there is a system in place to make sure that we get the right resources when we need them on time. There's also a natural propensity for everybody to want to be in charge. We heard that from Craig about the military wanting to be in charge, the governors wanting to be in charge, and so forth. I'm reminded of the time when I served in the Navy, and uh, I watched the skipper have a conversation with the ops officer on an evolution that was happening. And uh, it's, it was clear that the skipper was taking on the operation, so the ops officer just looked at him and said, if you want these bars, you can have them. I'll be glad to go back to my bunk and rest. That's the type of message that you need to give to the senior leadership in your organization when they are starting to impede on the operation. You have a role. We have a role. We need to respect each other's roles and responsibilities. But we need to make sure that we're exercising those now and not in the EOC in front of everybody. Finally, fourth, and Craig talked on this too, how am I going to pay for all this? Or to borrow the wor words of Yogi Berra, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. So if you don't think that the city manager is thinking about this from the first time he gets the call through recovery, you are wrong. You see this as the hurricane forecast uh, cone. That one's Charlie from 2004. You call that a, a tracking cone. I call it the cone of overtime, right? <laughs> so so what, I, uh, what I tell my team back home is uh, do what you have to do but do it within reason, because really there's no choice whether we're going to get reimbursed or not. And that is why you need a seat at the table. You need to understand the city's budget just as much as I do. You need to understand the impact on those resources. And you need to understand, as you are already aware, that not every event will be reimbursed under the Stafford Act. And then ask yourselves, do you really want an event that that's severe anyway, hitting your community? So we all need to be in a position that we can fund what I will call the routine run-of-the-mill disasters. And we rely upon you to do that with discretion and reason. So I want to take a moment to, uh, to reflect on the unsung heroes of emergency management. And I'm not sure there's many of them in the room today. Those are the accountants, the procurement specialists, the bookkeepers, the clerks. When I reach out to my fellow city managers, as I did this last week after Hurricane Matthew, I don't ask them if they need a fire strike team or building inspectors or traffic control personnel or heavy equipment operators. I ask them, do you need a team of bookkeepers and buyers? So, Ask yourselves, how many of you could function in your arena today without them? Now ask yourselves, how many of you conduct ongoing training for this cadre of personnel? And more importantly, ask yourselves, how many of you have thanked them lately for being part of your team? I would suggest that you go home and do that, because no disaster can be responded to without the people that are behind the first responders. And now let me conclude with my thank you to you. In my opinion, there is no more noble a profession than one in public service, whether at the federal, state, or local level. Many of you here today have dedicated your careers and your lives to that calling, often when many of our neighbors back home hold us in contempt for being part of government. But know this, you are the ones who 
run into building, burning buildings, pull innocents out of the line of fire, and are dedicated to picking up the pieces where ter when turmoil and despair are prevalent. The people we serve do not know your name. They will not recognize you in the supermarket nor realize the contribution that you make each and every day out there in the field or in the office. But your local government professional managers do. And on behalf of the 11,000 members of my association, the International City County Management Association, thank you for your service. It is truly appreciated. And thank you again for letting me talk to you this morning. I hope that I've left you not thinking of me as that city manager, but rather that city manager. Thank you. Thank you.